Welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing unique factorization domains. Okay, so in this video what we're going to talk about is now greatest common divisors, because there's a nice uh, interpretation of greatest common divisors of two elements uh, in a unique factorization domain. Okay, so let's start off by taking two elements of our unique factorization domain. So we'll have A and B, which are from our unique factorization domain, capital R here. And let's suppose that neither of them is equal to the additive identity of our unique factorization domain, and that also they're both not units. Okay, so let's write out A and B here. So let's say A is equal to some unit here, and then we'll have the irreducibles or the primes, since we can now call them that, uh, p1 to the power of alpha 1, p2 to the power of alpha 2, all the way along to pn to the power of alpha n here. Okay, uh, so there's our prime factorization of A then, and let's have our prime factorization of B here, and we'll have a unit which we'll call V, and then we'll have Q1 as our first irreducible here, to the power of beta 1, Q2, to the power of beta 2, and then we'll go all the way along to, let's say, Qm to the power of beta m here. Okay, so here are uh, prime factorizations of these two elements, a and b, and we're now going to try and understand what the greatest common divisor of these two elements is going to be. Okay, so we want to find uh, the greatest common divisor, the GCD, and I will call the GCD little d here. So, the first thing that we need to address is what do common divisors of these two elements look like? And then we'll address what the greatest common divisor is going to look like. So let's start off with common divisors. Okay, so a common divisor of A and B is something that must divide both A and B. Okay, so I'll put this down here. So the greatest common divisor absolutely has to be a common divisor firstly. So I'll put G, uh, sorry, CD here for common divisor. It must divide A and it must divide B. Okay, so if D is to be a common divisor, then it must divide A and it must divide B. But if it divides A and it divides B, then it must have part of um, the prime factorization of A and B within it. Okay, it must have a common part, a part that is in both of them. Okay, because remember to divide A and B means that you have to be able to write A as some multiple of D, and you also have to be able to write B as a multiple of D. Okay, but here is A and B. Okay, uh, so if we consider what the prime factorization of D is going to look like, it must be a common portion of the prime factorization of A and B. Otherwise, um, you'd end up with prime factorizations of these multiples of D not possibly equaling these prime factorizations uh, of A and B here. Okay, right. Uh, so, uh, what this means then is that D, its prime factorization must B, a common portion of the prime factorization of A and the prime factorization of B. So let me explain what I mean by this. So if we look at this prime factorization of A here, ignore the unit out the front, and look at the irreducibles or the primes here, okay? So we'll start off with P1 here. P1 is raised to the power of alpha 1 in the prime factorization of A. You now need to go through the prime factorization of B and ask, are there any P1s in the prime factorization of B, or any associates of P1 in the prime factorization of B? Okay, so remember an associate is just a unit times this. And if there are associates of P1 in this prime factorization, then just by changing the unit out the front here, we can get a power of P1 in this prime factorization. Remember, that's the uh, one little uh, difficulty with the uniqueness, that's where they're not unique, that you can change the associate that you're using by changing the unit at the front, so it's they're unique up to the fact that you can change the associates uh, and the unit out the front. Okay, so, you need to ask, are there any powers of P1 or an associate of P1 in the prime factorization of B? And if there are, you need to turn those associates into a power of P1, and then see how much of the power P1 do you have in common between the two, okay? Um, and then you can have that power of P1, if you like, in your common divisor. So the common divisor, then, is going to be made up of powers of irreducibles that appear in both uh, the prime factorization of A and the prime factorization of B. 
okay? And then it will indeed be a common divisor because you'll quite easily be able to find a multiple of D that gives you A and a multiple of D that gives you B. Okay, so that's uh, very nice and easy to understand. Now let's have a look at what the greatest common divisor is going to be, and you might have a good intuition for exactly how this is going to work. Okay, so the greatest common divisor, uh, I'll firstly just remind you of the definition of a greatest common divisor. So a greatest common divisor must be one such that if you take another common divisor, so for all other common divisors, all other d prime is an element of the commutative ring here, such that so such that d prime is also a common divisor, okay? So it divides uh, a and it divides b. So you take any other common divisor, then it must be the case that d prime divides the greatest common divisor d. So if d is a greatest common divisor, it must be a common divisor and it must also uh, be um, a multiple of all the other common divisors that you can possibly come up with. Okay, so I should stress that that's for all the other common divisors. It must be the case that all the other common divisors divide the greatest common divisor. Okay, so let's now interpret this in the context of a unique factorization domain. Well, hopefully you should be able to come up with an idea here. If we concocted a common divisor by uh, taking uh, common portions of the prime factorization of A and B, so taking portions of the prime factorization of A which are common uh, to the prime factorization of B, okay, uh, then the greatest common divisor, surely what we'll have to do is take the absolutely biggest thing that is common to both of them, okay, because then anything else that is a common divisor will have to divide that greatest thing, okay, so let me explicitly tell you how you'll construct this then. So you'll go through this prime factorization of A as I've described, and you'll start with the uh, prime P1 here, and you'll ask, is there any power of P1 or an associate of P1 in the prime factorization of B? And you'll have a look at what the greatest power of P1 that's common to both of them is, and you'll take that. So let's say that's P1 to the power of gamma 1 here. Then you'll look, go to P2 here, and again, what you'll ask is, are there any powers of P2 or an associate of P2 in this prime factorization of B? Okay, if you've got an associate of P2, of course, you can turn it into just a power of P2 by changing the unit out the front, and then take the highest power of P2 that's common to both of them, and let's call that P2 to the power of gamma 2. Now, of course, gamma 2 might be zero. There might be uh, no power of P2 in the prime factorization of B or any associate of P2, okay? But you continue on like this until you go along to the nth prime here, and you look for the highest power that's common to both of them. Okay, and of course, you don't need to bother going through the rest of the ones that are in B but not in A, because, of course, they're going to have no common part in A, so you just need to go through these bits of B, bit, sorry, bits of A, basically. Okay, and this then is going to be our greatest common divisor. Okay, so firstly it is still going to be a common divisor because a multiple of it will equal A and a multiple of it will equal B. That's perfectly obvious. Now why is it going to be the greatest common divisor? Well the reason it will be the greatest common divisor is if you take any other common divisor, so if you take any other D prime, then it's just going to be made up of common portions of the prime factorizations of A and B. I it will be made up of a sub portion of this, a sub power of P1, if you like, times a sub-power of um, gamma 2 here, etc. So a sub-portion of this, a little bit of it potentially, okay? This is the maximal possible, the biggest possible common divisor in a sense that you can construct here, okay? All the other ones are just going to be part of this basically, and of course they then will all be uh, divisors of this greatest one because you'll easily be able to find a multiple, um, just the other portion that's missing basically, the complement of this greatest common divisor that wasn't in the other common divisor to multiply it with to boost it up to this basically. Okay, so indeed this will be a greatest common divisor. Okay, so that is how you find the greatest common divisor of two elements uh, in a unique factorization domain. You find uh, the portion of the uh, prime factorization that is common to both of them, and you take the biggest common portion that you can possibly find, and that then is going to be your greatest common divisor. So let's do an example of using this, and of course we'll go uh, to the example of working with the integers. Okay, so to keep this nice and intuitive, let's just pick nice uh, 
um, positive integers, but of course you could do this with negative integers as well. There's nothing stopping you there. Okay, so let's take 324 and let's say 140, um, what should I go for, 8. Okay, uh, so let's see what the greatest common divisor of these two is. Now we could of course apply the Euclidean algorithm here, uh, but instead of doing that, let's find their prime factorizations, or a prime factorization of course, uh, and um, find which bits are common to both of them. Okay, so we will go for the most obvious prime factorization where we'll factorize them into uh, the uh, positive associates of each prime number. We won't bother uh, using negative ones. You could, of course, I want to stress that you can. It's perfectly valid to use the negative associates, but we're more familiar with using the positive associates, so let's just stick with that. Okay, so 324 first, so I'll split it first into 2 times 162 there. Okay, I think that's right, yes. Uh, and then we'll split 162 into 2 times 81. We'll switch, stick 81 into 9 times 9, and then, of course, that's just 3 to the power of 4, okay, because 9 is 3 times 3 and 9 is 3 times 3. Okay, so overall what we've got is that it's 2 squared times 3 to the 4. So if you wanted to write it out rigorously, I suppose we put the unit 1 in front of this, then we'd have 2 to the power of 2 and 3 to the power of 4. Okay, so that all went rather well. There's an A prime factorization of uh, 324, and I'll stress again that it's not the only one. You could say, okay, I'd like to use negative 2 here instead of 2, and you could switch to using negative 3 here as well. Okay, right, but that's our most intuitive one that we're used to from uh, school. Okay, so now let's do 148 now, so we'll write this as 2 times 74 firstly, then we'll split 74 into 2 times 37. Okay, and is 37 a prime number? Um, I think 37 is a prime number. Um, ooh, I, I don't know anything that would multiply to give that. Um, Yes, I think 37 is a prime number. Okay, I'm sorry if I'm ghastly wrong here, but this looks like 2 squared times 37. Okay, I hope I don't realise later that that is wrong. If it is wrong, I apologise. Okay, but clearly here, uh, what it looks like is the greatest common divisor is 2 squared, the biggest portion, the biggest common portion of the um, prime factorization here is 2 squared, so it looks therefore as though our greatest common divisor is 4. A common divisor, another example of a common divisor would of course be 2. 2 would be a common divisor, it divides both of them, uh, and you can see that it also divides the greatest common divisor, which is 4 here. Okay, right, uh, so I hope that is the correct answer to this problem. I think the greatest common divisor is 4. We could just check it by doing the Euclidean algorithm, and I think, in fact, we will have a go at doing the Euclidean algorithm. So let's just do the Euclidean algorithm and see if we can check this. So, uh, just a nice reminder of the Euclidean algorithm then. 324, we need to write it as some multiple of 148, and I should stress again, it, there was no need to put 324 as the first one. You could have put 148, uh, and it would still work, it's just a Again, we'll use the most intuitive one, the way we would have done it at school, okay, because that's most familiar, uh, so we'll put 324, the biggest one, first. Okay, so it looks as though it's going to be 2 times 148, uh, plus something at uh, the remainder here. So 2 times 148 will give us 280, 96, so we'll then end up with 4 plus 24, so it'll be plus 28 here. Then we'll get 148 is equal to how many 28s? Well, 10 28s would be 280, uh, 5 28s would therefore be 140, so I think it's going to be 5 times 28 plus 8 here. Then we'll have 28 is equal to how many 8s? It'll be 3 times 8 which will be 24 plus 4, and this is looking perfectly good. 8 is equal to 2 times 4, so our final remainder is indeed 4. So that is uh, our greatest common divisor of 4. So everything's working beautifully here. The Euclidean algorithm has given us the exact same number as we would have got uh, using the prime factorizations here. Okay, uh, so we'll have a break here, and in the next video what we'll talk about is the big, big proof. The proof that all principal ideal domains are unique factorization domains.